And on this January morning, should we look back when things were still the way they should be? That sounds promising. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, January 1988. Um, because I thought 30 years ago, let's go back and see what was going on, at least in my world of wrestling. But uh, uh, as we know, the territories were starting to falter. Um, a lot of them were going by the wayside. I think, was it 80, 89 was the year Continental went away. Yes. Um, but 88, uh, it was, it was starting to feel that. And even Crockett's business was, was starting to, uh, was starting to go down with the end of 87 business has started to slack off. And it wasn't until the great American bash tour of 88 that things came back. And that's when David and Francis tried to, and Jackie tried to get Jim Crockett not to sell because business had come back, but by then it was, it was too late. But that late 87 through mid 88 period where the, the TV revenue uh, from the syndication network, a commercial revenue didn't come in as it was supposed to Vince had sabotaged Crockett and blocked him off pay-per-view. He had to get Turner broadcasting involved to get the great American bash 88 on pay-per-view that year. Um, so it was kind of a down period, but when you look back on it today, it's still, you know, it's like, oh my God, if things could only be that good again. But I looked back in January 1988, the Midnight Express and I made $7,000 a piece that month, which was probably the worst month that we had had for Jim Crockett promotion since we'd come in in 85. And of course, that's equivalent to, <clears throat> I think it's 14700 and something dollars or whatever today, but still from what we were used to. And of course, one, two, three, four, five, six, we had seven days off that month because it was freak winter weather in the Carolinas and we were snowed out a couple of days. So seven days off in a month was unheard of at that point in time. Uh, but the money was not too good, but there were some interesting things that happened. Would you like to... I haven't even opened the book any further yet. I wanted to re-experience this with you. Would you like to take a look at it? Let's take a look at it. I'm thinking of a few January 88 items you may touch on. Well, January 1st was the Atlanta Omni, <clears throat> New Year's Day as always. Um, and the main event was a cage match for a wild card spot for the Bunkhouse Stampede Finals. Because you remember every year dur during December for a few years there, Dusty ran the bunkhouse stampedes, and whoever ran the, ran whoever won the most of them uh, would be the bunkhouse stampede champion. And there was always some some of uh, uh, doubt. Or like in '87, it was Dusty and Big Bubba Rogers had tied, and they had to go in the cage in Pittsburgh <laughs> and settle the thing. And that was you know sell out sixteen thousand six hundred people, a hundred and sixty five thousand dollar house. It's still the most people that have ever seen a wrestling match in the city of Pittsburgh, indoors at least. I think they ran some outdoor shows in the sixties. Um, for Dusty and Bubba and Dusty won the bunkhouse stampede. Well, this it was a wild card for the bunkhouse finals that were going to be held on pay per view. And in the Omni, it was beautiful Bobby Eaton, Dusty Rhodes, Dick Murdoch, Nikita Koloff, and Black Bart. <laughs> I love Bart, but one of these things is not like the other in that list. And in the end, um, uh, Dusty defeated Bobby. Um, he, you had to throw the guy over the cage or out the door, right? So I'd thrown the racket in to Bobby, and he got some heat on Dusty with the racket, and almost he got Dusty, and you've never lived until you've seen somebody try to get Dusty Rhodes up on not only the top rope, but to throw him over the top of the cage. But Bobby was trying. And he couldn't do it, so I threw the racket up again, but Dusty got it instead and grabbed uh, grabbed the racket and hammered Bobby with it several times and knocked him off the top of the cage to the floor. So he won. Dusty Rhodes going to the bunkhouse finals in front of a $78,000 house, and that was down. That was probably only about 8,000 people, um, whereas traditionally New Year's did better in, in Atlanta. Uh, the following day, was Asheville, North Carolina at the Asheville Civic Center. And once again, it was – I don't want to say Dusty had just kind of lost grip on the booking, but he was doing some different things and some stranger things. And in this case, Bobby was against Nikita Koloff for the world TV title, and Stan was just on a single match on the card against Todd Champion, who he defeated. Uh, but then Bobby put Nikita over for the, you know with the TV title on the line. 
Uh, but, you know, splitting the Midnight Express up, we did a lot of singles that month. And it was just odd. And and the house was only $10,200. Uh, then January 3rd, we went to Baltimore for a TV taping. It was the A&B syndicated shows, Worldwide and uh, NWA Pro. And that was the famous night. It was $72,000 in Baltimore, which wasn't even in those prices. Those days, wasn't even 7,000 people. It was a horrible, horrible house. But they had advertised TV taping with a couple of dark matches. So, you know, but that was the night that on the A show, Worldwide Wrestling, Dick Murdoch challenged Nikita Koloff for the world TV title, and they went 20 minutes Broadway. Do you remember me telling you a story? (laughs) Yeah, I think so. <laughs> we, were, we were sitting in the back and, you know, it's like, and, and bless Nikita, but we got the finish and we're like, what the fuck? Because Nikita was not at that time an accomplished wrestler. It's going to go, you know, a 20 minute draw and a cold match. Um, and, and, you know, I was like, ah, oh, Christ. And Murdoch's like, ah, there's going to be shit. So I said, you know something, Dick? I said, every single person in a locker room, every single one of the boys, thinks there's no way you can have a good fucking match with Nikita Koloff going 20 minute Broadway. They do. I said, yeah, I said, I heard a couple of them talking about it. There's no way this match is going to stink is what is. Oh, they think that, huh? That was the best Nikita Koloff match that he ever wrestled. If you go back and look at it, I think this aired on January 16th, 1988 by my notes on worldwide wrestling, but Murdoch versus Nikita 20 minute Broadway. Now I'm not saying it was flair and steamboat, but it was the best Nikita Koloff single match probably that was ever held. And uh, because I challenged Dickie because he was just going to he was going to sit down. I could see because he was just like. Pfft. And so I challenged him a little bit to, uh, you know, to step up and, and he did it by cracky. But that was once again, seventy two thousand dollar house TV taping. We made two hundred bucks. Right. Because we weren't advertising the dark matches. And then I believe because January 4th is off, I can't remember, but we got snowed in one time in Baltimore. That may have been it. Then January 5th, Spartanburg, South Carolina, Midnight Express versus Sting and Ron Simmons, uh, who we defeated because they weren't a full time tag team. It was just, you know, but once again, the house was forty two hundred dollars in Spartanburg. That was not even uh, 500 people. Um, it, and, and, and I don't know why that anybody thought the Midnight Express versus Sting and Ron Simmons was going to draw any money at that point in time. But anyway, that's the match we had, and we, we beat them uh, with a double-team maneuver. And then went on to Atlanta, where we had started doing the Atlanta TBS shows for Saturday and Sunday. We'd started, instead of Saturday mornings, we'd started taping them on some Wednesday nights. So that not only took another night away from a paying gig – uh, but also it, it, you know, it, it, it took, actually it took two nights away from a paying gig. Cause used to, we'd do Atlanta TV on Saturday morning and then do a house show on Saturday night. And we'd do a house show on Wednesday. This time, you know, so it, it was, uh, it was odd. And I never really, I, I think it may have had something to do with TBS, not wanting to bring their crew in on Saturday mornings anymore. But, um, on that particular night, January 6th, we, Accepted the Midnight Express, accepted the Tag Team of the Year Award from Bill Apter. And we had a couple of matches, and I was managing Dick at the time also, and he had a couple of matches. We did the Saturday and Sunday show and got paid a whopping $40, which is what you got paid for Atlanta TV in those days. Um, then we were off on the 7th. Then we were also off on the 8th because we were supposed to be in Newton, North Carolina, but we got snowed out. Uh, this is going to be a recurring theme here. Uh, Saturday, January 9th, we were in Huntington, West Virginia at the beautiful Huntington Civic Center. The main event, Midnight Express versus Dusty Rhodes and Nikita Koloff in a cage match. $20,000 house. Oh. Yes. Barely, barely two. I'm telling you, business was January and February. We made seven grand on each of those months. And that's why in March we went in and, and talked to Crockett about our new contracts which we ended up signing, which made us the uh, most unpopular people on the roster when TBS bought the company because our new contracts were for 225 grand a year apiece. And because he thought all that pay-per-view revenue was going to be coming in and all the syndicated TV revenue was going to be coming in and it didn't come in. But anyway, 
So we got 445 bucks, which I guess would be almost a grand in today's money, but, you know, on the $20,000 house because we were in the main event, but still. Of course, we put them over. And then the following day, Sunday, January 10th, Greenville, South Carolina, Memorial Auditorium, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Listen to this. <laughs> we were booked against Ronnie Garvin and the mighty Wilbur. But thank God something <laughs> happened, and Sting replaced the mighty Wilbur. So Sting and Garvin, we got disqualified. Greenville, South Carolina, Brian, the house, $2,800. How? 300 people. Part of it was weather, because as you recall, we were just snowed out 100 miles down the road the day before. It was a horrible weather month that month, but part of it was... Two o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday when there was a Monday night town, half a card because, uh, uh, you know, it was just the B team on the on the, the lineup and the Greenville had been damaged. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's the all time low in the history of Greenville, South Carolina. But we went that night back to Charlotte at the Coliseum where we had another TV taping. See, that's the thing. Here's another thing that affected <clears throat> the houses and the gates in a lot of these major markets because uh, Crockett had for years been doing TV tapings in little high school and college gyms within 100, 125 miles of Charlotte, Gaffney, South Carolina. Spartanburg was a big TV location. Um, you know, Meisenheimer, North Carolina, where we, we helped Tully and Arn beat the rock and roll for the tag team titles the previous September. Uh, we would do 1,500, 2,000 people in those little gyms. They'd be sold out, sometimes sold out in advance because the people never got to see live action. But then putting all of their biscuits in the same basket – they were trying to do TV tapings in major arenas because they had been told and led to believe and Crockett had been led to believe that TV tapings and the syndicated revenue and the like Vince, let's do what Vince is doing. So they started doing TV tapings in major arenas and they'd advertise one or two dark matches and the rest of it is see the stars of TV taping. So you wouldn't have a full card. People didn't know what they were going to fucking see. And they're used to these cards that were four and five and six matches deep in big cities like Charlotte and Greensboro and Baltimore and Atlanta with, you know, grudge matches and title matches. And now, even if they got main event matches on TV, the people who had seen TV tapings knew that they would be shorter matches. And, and it, it, you would have to sit through a lot of squashes with the Italian stallion. So they weren't coming. I don't even have the house for Charlotte down. We got paid 280 bucks. Uh, so it wasn't very good, and uh, we had a six-man tag with uh, Dickey in the midnight against Brad Armstrong, Tim Horner, and the Italian Stallion. And then uh, we were in the cage against Dusty and Nikita on on the B show, which was a short cage match with no finish, where Murdoch had run into the into the got the key from the referee, uh, run into the cage, and they had to run us off uh, with the the troops. So it was, just, it was TV matches, non-finishes, and major arenas was not helping at all. Monday, January 11th, we were supposed to be in Fayetteville. We could not be there. We were stuck in the fucking snow. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that is the day that I actually <laughs> pulled out of my driveway on, on the street that I lived on, turned left, slid sideways into a ditch, and stayed there. So I got like literally 65 feet from my house. And it, in, in North Carolina, it's snow of six and eight and nine and ten inches. It closes the whole fucking city down, right? <clears throat> so I don't know if they ran the show, but I, I couldn't make it. Um, January 12th, North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Nice little spot show against Ronnie Garvin and Sting. Um, of course, uh, they beat us because it was a spot show. Why not? $10,200 house. Well, not bad for a Tuesday night spot show, but that's where we should have been doing the television taping. It's where we in, in towns like we used to. Then Wednesday, January 13th, we go back to Atlanta for another TV taping on a Wednesday night. And it, once again, we've got to fl fly down to Atlanta, take the fucking taxi uh, to uh, center, st not center stage time, but to TBS and then, uh, uh, you know, at least we had Crockett's plane where we could get back that night, but blah. Um, Thursday, January 14th, we were going to be against the Garvins in Fisherville, Virginia. 
But that, I believe, I've, I've got it scratched out. So either the show was canceled for snow or, uh, or whatever, rerouted, but we were off that night. Friday night, January 15th, we go to Richmond, Virginia, one of the biggest cities and, and most uh, the biggest box office cities in the Crockett Territory. And guess what we did? An Atlanta TV taping for January 23rd. $55,000 house, about 5,500 people, let's say. And that's a Bobby had, had uh, tweaked his knee, so he had to take several days off, which is one of the only times I remember Bobby taking time off. So it was Stan Lane and Dick Murdoch against Dusty and Nikita in the cage. And then we did a tag match with uh, Dickie and Stan on TV. And, you know, we, we were in a dark match. We got $475 payoff, but, you know, blah. Uh, then the next day we go to Philadelphia where it was supposed to be Dusty and Bobby, but since Bobby was hurt, it became Dusty and Stan who uh, Dusty beat, uh, Stan with a cross body. <laughs> and that was a pretty goddamn decent house. I don't have it recorded, but we made $825. Then listen to this one. We've been in Richmond, Virginia on Friday night for a glorified TV taping, right? We go to Philadelphia on Saturday, January 16th for a pretty good house. Sunday afternoon, we're in Charleston, West Virginia for another TV taping where we basically did a match and an interview and, and an interview on the B show and got paid 75 bucks because Charleston sucked because we weren't in a dark match and it was a TV taping. And then we took Crockett's plane, jumped in the fucking car or jumped in, jumped in a cab, went to the airport, took the uh, Crockett's plane to St. Louis that night. So we went from Richmond to Philadelphia to Charleston on Sunday afternoon, St. Louis Sunday night. And uh, the, I managed uh, Dick Murdoch against Dusty in the main event, which was kind of a fucking thrill to manage Dick Murdoch against Dusty Rhodes. And um, basically a uh, uh, disqualification finish, and it was a $400 payoff. I do not have the house recorded, but that wasn't anything special. And from being in St. Louis on Sunday night, Monday, we're back in Columbia, South Carolina, <laughs> where I managed Murdoch against Sting. And uh, we got disqualified and a hundred and fifty dollar payoff because Columbia was si and and plus once again the weather outside was frightful. Then this was a, an interesting. Um, originally, we were scheduled on Tuesday, January nineteenth, to be off because it was supposed to be a travel day because that's when they had set up a two day tour of the West Coast. And originally, we were booked on it, but thank God they took us off. Honolulu, Hawaii, on Wednesday, January 20th at the Blaisdell Arena. Now, I don't know if they ran that show or not. I think they did. I think they did, but we were we were taken off and put back on the Carolina team because they had so much talent, they'd run two towns a night. But think about this. If we'd have had to, we would have flown all day on Tuesday, January 19th to get to Hawaii in time to get up the next day and basically eat lunch and go to the building and work. And then the following day, they came back to Los Angeles and ran the forum. <laughs> and, and, and then we're back the following day in, in, uh, and then came back to the Carolina. So we got taken off. And that is also, by the way, uh, when Bubba left, because you'll recall that Bubba got his payoff about this time for, the Starcade 87 scaffold match with the rock and roll and the midnight. And we all got $10,000 a piece. Well, Bubba was not in the match, but he climbed the scaffold and fucked around a little spot with Ricky up there. And he was part of the team. He got five grand. And that's around about the first of the year is when he'd got his check. That's when he called Vince and became Hulk Hogan's, uh, arch rival in one of the biggest house show runs they ever had. So originally it was supposed to be the midnight and Bubba against the rock and roll and Dr. Death in Hawaii and Los Angeles. But Bubba was gone at that time. The rock and roll had left possibly over the same fucking reason because they didn't like their, I can't remember why they left. So all this shit was falling apart, right? Normally I do good months, but this was a sucky month. So anyway, it, we got a day off instead of having to fly to Hawaii for no apparent reason. And then while they were in Hawaii, we were in Georgetown, South Carolina against Ronnie Garvin and Jimmy Valiant. And the house did 16 grand in Georgetown and we made 300 fucking dollars. 
And then the next day we were in Chesterfield, South Carolina against Ronnie and Jimmy Garvin and the house did almost 10 grand and we got another 125 or whatever. So we actually came out on the better end of that. January 22nd was Elberton, Georgia, where we were originally booked against the Rock and Roll Express. But since they were gone, no, Ricky left. That's what it was. Ricky left first because we worked with Robert Gibson and Barry Windham. And that house in Elberton, Georgia, was $11,300. We made a couple of hundred bucks. So as you can see, the the Carolina spot shows were doing <laughs> adjusted for rent as good or better as towns like fucking St. Louis. And they still couldn't figure this out. Uh, then uh, January 23rd, Lakeland, Florida. Midnight Express versus Ronnie Garvin and Barry Windham. We were disqualified and a $50,000 bounty match, Murdoch versus Dusty Rhodes and Dusty won. 20 grand in Lakeland. Not bad. But you remember I talked about that bunkhouse stampede pay-per-view? Yep. Here's the way they routed us. We'd been in Elberton, Georgia on Friday night, January 22nd. Then we're in Lakeland, Florida on Saturday night, January 23rd. Sunday, January 24th was the Bunkhouse Stampede pay-per-view at the Nassau Coliseum in Long Island. We went literally as far as you can go from south to north in the United States the day of a pay-per-view. Had to get from the airport to the Nassau Coliseum <clears throat> and set up and, and, and go. And if you'll recall, that was what was universally panned as the worst Crockett Big Show ever, right? You remember that? Oh, easily, yeah. The Midnight Express didn't even have a match as a tag team on the show. It was Bobby versus Nikita for the TV title and Stan versus Jimmy Garvin in a match that was scratched because they found out they only had like a two and a half hour window or whatever and scratched a couple of the prelim matches. So the house in the Nassau Coliseum did $80,000. We had no business being in New York. That was Vince's town. We should have never even fucking tried it. Uh, that's where I've, that was the first time I'd ever been in the Nassau Coliseum. The people were so cold and so miserable. It was like somebody had held a gun to them to come in. They reacted to nothing. Not that Bobby and Nikita gave me anything to react to because <laughs> Bobby was trying, but he didn't do the job that Dickie did uh, with Nikita. 20-minute Broadway on pay-per-view in a cold match with Nikita Koloff for the TV title. Um so at any rate, I hated New York from that point on. Uh, the, it, it was not our – it was like it was like I learned in Boston when we had the Rock and Roll Express and Heavenly Body Smoky Mountain tag title match there. And they had probably the best tag team match that had been seen on WWF television in years at that point. And the people were like, the. And then here comes Doink the Clown and a bunch of midgets dressed like fucking Doink, and the place went berserk. We were in enemy territory. They didn't get fucking wrestling there. They got sports entertainment, and we never should have made the – anyway, I bet they had to pay to get out of the building that night, much less the fucking talent pay. Now, that was also uh, a pay-per-view, so back then, you didn't get your money for a couple months, right? And that was a pay-per-view that was sabotaged. Uh, it, it wasn't as bad as the Survivor Series 87, where only – or not Survivor, but uh, Starcade 87, where because of the Survivor Series, only like five or six cable companies carried our pay-per-view. They got a few more, but we saw with that Drismal house, 80 grand in prices up there in those days, that wasn't probably 5,000 people or whatever. And we're thinking, well, this is going to be miserable. We're going to get nothing. We ended up getting five grand. For that fucking shitty match, <laughs> I guess Crockett was embarrassed. It was an embarrassment payoff. But that was that was the beginning of the end. After that, we didn't do another pay-per-view until June, Great American Bash, and that's when Turner Broadcasting had uh, exerted some muscle and got us full clearances and et cetera. But that's because they were in talks to buy the company. And again, you had the Royal Rumble, the first Royal Rumble running against that pay-per-view. Oh, yeah, and that, and that's right, and that was the, the Royal Rumble was against that one. So, and... People have actually said that Vince didn't sabotage uh, Crockett's efforts to get on pay-per-view. There, and and I've, I've heard that from several places. I'm like, fuck, was everybody blind, deaf, and dumb? That's exactly what he did, including going to the cable companies and saying, if you carry this guy's pay-per-view, I won't let you have WrestleMania. And, of course, he was like Trump blathering out of his ass. He didn't mean it, and they all got to carry WrestleMania anyway, whoever carried the NWA pay-per-view. But still, that yes – 
he blocked. That's why Crockett went under, not because of the, even though this booking from January 88, you can't tell, but between the TV syndicated revenue not being what it was and being blocked off a pay-per-view when he thought this was going to be a, a gold mine, turned out to be a landmine. Uh, that's that's what happened. Vince sabotaged him. Anyway, so we leave New York, thankfully to God, on Sunday, January 24th. We leave there the next morning, and we're in Fayetteville on Monday night, Fayetteville, North Carolina, against the Garvins, $5,400 house. Now, Fayetteville, by the way, was where, for example, the Great American Bash 86 did $101,000 to see Ric Flair versus Robert Gibson for the world title. Fayetteville had been a Crockett town going back for 40 and 50 years, but yeah. Monday night, half a card. Then Tuesday, we go to Raleigh, Raleigh, North Carolina, for another TV taping. We had cameras up our asses everywhere we went for no money because all these TV taping payoffs were drizzle unless you were figuring the dark match. And even then, it wasn't what a normal payoff for the town would have been because people didn't want to come see the TV tapings. So that night, um, <laughs> we had a six-man tag with Dick Murdoch and then Dusty Ch or Bobby challenged Dusty for the U.S. title. That was the one people have, have tweeted that lately. Um, where uh, uh, Basically, there was a reverse decision, but then uh, uh, Dusty knocked Bobby out of the ring and grabbed me and slapped me around and broke my glasses. So that, that helped us keep some heat there. <laughs> anyway, January 27th, guess what we did? TV. <laughs> Atlanta TV, the Saturday and Sunday show. Um, the, the, one of the shows uh, was uh, the deal with Misty Blue, where she said, oh, I'd love to learn how to come off the top rope like Bobby Eaton and do all the stuff that Bobby Eaton does. I'm like, well, I can teach you. And she's giving me the finger up under the chin. like, And I get in the ring, and she drop kicks me. And then Dusty and Barry Windham reveal her as the mystery partner for the upcoming show in, in Baltimore. Uh, but So that was fun, but we made $40. And then to Thursday, January 28th, we were supposed to be in Harrisonburg, Virginia, against Brad Armstrong and Tim Horner. And I've got off, and I believe that may have been a snow situation also i'm not sure but uh but we weren't there january 29th pittsburgh the civic center the igloo bob eaton versus dusty Rhodes, and dusty went over and stan versus ricky santana in a just a single match on the cards once again eh, sixty thousand dollar house which was great you know for what we'd been seeing and we made 650 bucks but you know, it, 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 yeah. and then Saturday, January 30th, finally, thank fucking Christ, Greensboro, North Carolina, it was a TV taping, but they had advertised a couple of dark matches. I think Flair was in, in something important, possibly against Barry Windham, and we did a $105,000 house, so about 10,000 people. Greensboro was back where it ought to be. And the main event uh, that we were figured in was a double bull rope match with the Midnight Express against Dusty and Nikita, which they won, of course. And then also, <laughs> uh, fucking Dusty uh, uh, defended the U.S. title on TV against Bobby again. And um, we won by count out uh, because uh, but then Dusty made his own comeback. No, I'm sorry. We won by count out. Uh, but uh, then Dusty made his own comeback and, and enrolled Bobby up, and the referee counted three anyway. You, you see a pattern here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we made $1,100 that night, and we were off on January 31st. So that was that was the and – we've given you the highs of Jim Crockett promotions and some of those old days, but that was a drismal suck ass fucking month. And, and by the way, that Baltimore, hold on, let me skip ahead. The, um, where, when was Baltimore? The one that we, sh that's right. Baltimore was February 12th, Lincoln's birthday, where we shot that misty blue thing for, it wasn't a TV taping. Thank God. And the main event was a cage match with me Dusty or me, Dick Murdoch and the Midnight Express against Dusty, Nikita, Barry Windham and Misty Blue. That was the main event in Baltimore. The only time we ever had that match in a snowstorm. Once again, 
we got there, it was four inches of fucking snow and it was still coming down. And I'm like, oh, fuck, right? We did a $103,000 house, made $1,000 a piece. Maybe Misty didn't, I'm not sure. <laughs> but that was an example of, you know, when they really want to see it, they'll come. But it, it, it just, it, looking back, it, I think Dusty was starting to get burnt a little bit. And he'd had people leave and he'd had to change his his booking on several occasions and the the whole pay-per-view thing going up in fucking flames. And January, February, March, and April, especially April, as I recall, in uh, at that time, it was it was horrible. And that's when they went into talks with TBS. But then all of a sudden, as they were in the talks, as soon as the end of June came around, and that bash tour, and it was the biggest bash tour that we'd had. I think we've gone over it uh, before. But it was the biggest bash tour we'd had. We worked like 42 and 45 days. The houses were incredible. We set some records. And that's when, you know, as I'm just looking through, Norfolk, Virginia, $105,000. Charlotte Memorial Stadium, $100,000. That one wasn't good. It should have been two hundred. dollars Greenville, South Carolina, $61,000. Uh, Orlando, Florida, $83,000. Amarillo, $50,000. Miami, fifty-eight thousand. Raleigh, one hundred and one thousand dollars sellout. Pittsburgh, eighty. Baltimore, two hundred and six thousand dollars for the pay-per-view. Chicago, a hundred thousand. Um, Huntsville, Alabama, did thirty-one grand. Chattanooga did eighty-three thousand dollars. Richmond did a hundred and nine. Greensboro did a hundred. Um, that month, Cincinnati, eighty-four thousand dollars. Philadelphia, one hundred and forty-seven thousand. St. Louis, eighty-one thousand. Uh. Fayetteville, $66,000. Savannah, Georgia, $58,000 that never drew. Jacksonville, sixty-six dollars Detroit, one hundred and three. dollars Landover, Maryland, $157,000. Uh, Seattle, Washington, $96,000. Oakland, California, $98,000. So the point is, by that summer, he put us back in tag team matches, and we had gone through the program with the Fantastics, and we're about to start with Tully and Arn. Um, gotten some new talent in the booking was back on track. The people were starting to come out and it was too late. They'd already got so far in the hole from that miscalculation over the pay-per-view and the television business and truthfully and honestly, some suck ass cards and way too many TV tapings everywhere that nobody wanted to see. Uh, it, it was, it was too late. And, and as, as a matter of fact, even off the great American bash that year, Business got better because in September when he could bring back Flair and Luger for the world title and started the program with Tully and Arn, the bash in Richmond, as I believe I'd said, did a hundred grand. But in September, Richmond did $141,000. We sold the place pretty much slap dab out and it was the all time record gate. And it was six weeks later, they've sold the company to TBS. That's what I was going insane about there. In hindsight, if they hadn't had that six or eight month period from late 87 through June of 88, it would have been a different ball game. And if they hadn't put so much uh, thought into and, and, and put so much faith into pay-per-view and TV syndication revenue. Well, you know, Jim, Dusty gets a lot of blame for the problems that would happen to the company. His booking gets a lot of blame. And, you know, look, for the most part, to be honest, his booking, there were a lot of holes in it as late 87 into 88, you know, that time period was taking place. But when you look back at the big picture and you see, you know, like you said, Vince was able to keep them off pay-per-view. You know, Dusty and the booking was an issue, but the real issue seems to be the overall office or lack thereof the business. of an yeah. office of, of Jim Crockett Jr. having an advisor who could tell him what's a good idea and what's not a good idea. And just a real a team of serious business professionals as opposed to, oh, this guy's been around for years. He used to work for my dad. Yeah, I, well, and that's and, you know, Jimmy had did one shoot interview here a few years ago where he basically said, hey, it was all my fault. Don't blame the fucking CPA, the accountant. That was hopelessly in the hole and over his head. Don't blame everybody else. It was my fault. And that, and that was good of him to do that because it was really because the buck stopped there. But um, I don't think Dusty – Dusty had been booking since 84. So by, by 87, three years of doing some of the biggest business that had ever been done in wrestling. And, and we know for a fact 
that that because I have it in in a lawsuit deposition that Crockett Promotions grossed twenty one million dollars in nineteen eighty six on wrestling, not on fucking pay per view and not on fucking TV commercials, but on wrestling, and that would be equivalent to around you know almost fifty million today. And he that was in eighty six. He was one of almost fifteen full time territories in the United States still operating, and Dusty was responsible for that. And Dusty was a he was a great booker in terms of the big shows and the big picture, and he got guys hot, and he got guys over, and he got heat on heels, and he got baby faces over. And J.J. was there for details, but sometimes you couldn't tell Dusty any of the details. Like the one time in, in Greensboro when I went up to him, I said, Dusty, the, you know, the finish you just gave us with the Fantastics, we did that uh, two shows ago here with the Road Warriors. He said, that's okay, kid. They won't notice this different people. <laughs> all right what am i gonna say it's fucking dusty um and i think he's he lost his way there for a little while with like i said late 87 with people leaving and and things changing and plus all the tv tapings but overall he got it back in 88 and was doing as as big a business for a while there until they sold as 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 he was in, you know, 85 and 86 and, and a lot of 87. Um, but the, the, even if the booking was shite all the way around, it wouldn't have lost him as much money as they spent money that they didn't have yet because they thought it was coming. They bought the second plane and they bought all those territories, Kansas City and Florida, to get the TV syndicated syndication to get all their TV slots. And, and <clears throat> you know, they, they Crockett had people telling him, well, look how much money Vince makes with this TV syndication. Well, we'll do the same thing. But Vince had a huge front office of people and experienced people, and he was in a big major media center, New York, and, and he did it first. And instead of chasing Vince and trying to replicate Vince's business model, they should have concentrated on, as Flair said many times, the Southeast, the South, and the Midwest, and and don't go past the Mississippi, and it had been a lot better than it was. But there's no way that Dusty Rhodes just being off booking could have cost him 2 or $3 million. It was the planes and the TV times and the, the TV slots and the TV tapings and the, the overall expansion across the, the country that they felt like that they had to do. And when taking Starcade out of Greensboro and putting it in Chicago, because the, the same idiots that said we were going to make all that money on TV syndication said, well, who wants to, nobody knows where Greensboro is. We need to be in Chicago and New York. Well, f f okay. So they went to Chicago and did a gross of a third of what they could have done in Greensboro. I didn't think it was, it mattered how big the city was. I thought it mattered how big the house was, but apparently I was wrong. So it, all those things came in the same year um, or in the same one year period from 87 to 88. It just all came home to roost at the same time. So to say that Dusty's booking, unless he held Jimmy down and said, God damn you, you are going to buy a second plane. He might have actually, but even the second plane wouldn't have goddamn been that bad as, as, as related to some of the other things. Of course they did sometimes, they they got so uh, in '86. I remember when they got that first plane. J.J. Dillon called me one time. And we we're going to Greenville, which was a hundred and five miles from my my apartment at the time, Greenville, South Carolina. And J.J. called me about three in the afternoon. He said, uh, "Be at the at Butler Aviation at the airport at at five o'clock. We're taking the plane to Greenville." I'm like, "What?" I said, "Because it costs like twenty five hundred bucks an hour to operate that fucking Gulfstream." I said, I'm going to drive, JJ. I don't want, I'm not going to fly 100 miles. I give my spot to somebody else. And I left my apartment at the same time that they all had to get to the airport and I beat them to the building. But they just, they, they, it was going so good. Everybody was living like a rock star. That's, a, you've heard Flair say that Crockett's uh, office parking lot over on Briar Bend Drive looked like a Mercedes dealership. I was the only one that didn't have either a Mercedes, a BMW, or a Lincoln Continental. I broke down and got a, a one of those T-Birds when they came out with the Turbo. Remember, an 85 T-Bird Turbo. And boy, it looked nice. It was bright red. But it only cost me seventeen grand. for fuck's sake. 
so when I'd have when the magazine photographers would would come down and and shoot something, I'd I'd just open somebody else's door and act like I was getting in their their Mercedes. But you know, I I just I will not hear anybody say it was Dusty's fault. It wasn't Dusty's fault, you know, because the guy running the company should have said, "Hey, you know what? We might be spending too much money that we ain't got coming in yet, just because a lot of these people are supposedly smart, say it's going to." And Dusty would he'd run a big show, but he got big returns. And you know, like I said, uh, that. That period, he he kind of got in the weeds a little bit, but he was still able to pull out the big shows, and finally he got it all together and got to the wagon circled and got business back up. And then, okay, July, August, and September of 1988, we're doing six-figure houses in all those places I just mentioned. We, we uh, Record gates in some towns they've been running for years. October 31st or November 1st, whichever day it was officially that TBS took over. Look at what, and then they fired Dusty the first week or second week of December. Look what they were doing in January. If you want to talk about sabotage, you want to talk about bad booking, and you want to talk about people that didn't want to see shit, you compare January 19, which we might do sometime, January 1989 with January 88. It looked like we were in the middle of fucking WrestleMania season that shitty month that I just told you about. There nothing happened in January 89 except the bottom fell out of the business and they never got it back because they continued to go further and further away from the Carolinas towns, more TV tapings, and Dusty wasn't booking. And as you'll recall, Jimmy Crockett was the interim booker for about six weeks until they got George Scott in and he pretty much finished the thing the rest of the way off. You talked about the uh, predatory business practices of the WWF trying to prevent Crockett from getting on pay-per-view. What were your thoughts a couple months later from this when you guys ran the first clash against WrestleMania and it was considered a success success by so many people? But what were you guys thinking when you heard the news that you guys were going to, in a way, strike back? Oh, we loved it. Why do do you think that the the first clash of champions, WrestleMania Day 88, (laughs) why do you think that the two of the matches on the card placed in the wrestling observer and the pro wrestling torch and, and Steve Beverly's Matt watch and everything else is matches of the year, because goddamn everybody's like you motherfuckers will fix you up. You fucked us on pay-per-view and kept us from these 10 and 15, $20,000 payoffs. We're going to fuck with you. And Ric Flair not only had the match of the year and made sting a star, but remember us in the fantastics, he was like, motherfuckers, we're going to show you what, what this shit's like. And that goddamn match stands up today. There, we, we could have dropped a fucking cow in the ring and slaughtered it and not got any people any more excited than that match. And everybody was up that day because they wanted to, uh, they wanted to prove a point. And we did ding WrestleMania that year. We took a lot away from it. And, uh, and we were happy to do it because turnabout is fair play, as they say. And that's when your feud with Donald Trump began. Yeah, that's right. They were at, and that's another thing. We were in Greensboro in front of wrestling fans, and they were going fucking hooting, hollering crazy. And they were at Trump Plaza in front of, wasn't that like one of the deadest crowds in the history of wrestling big shows that year? Yes, it was all the high rollers, however many of those yeah. actually were. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the, it w- there was never any doubt that the NWA in-ring product was so much superior to the WWF product during all the 80s. And I'm not I'm not knocking the individual talent that worked there. I mean, you know, Slaughter and Patterson in the in the alley fight match and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, they had good matches on occasion, but anybody with the power of eyesight could tell that the NWA in-ring product was so far ahead of the WWF that it it wasn't even an issue. But we didn't have the infrastructure in the office. We still had, what was the goddamn CPA's name? And, and, you know, uh, the three old ladies that were, that were the secretaries in the front office and Gene Anderson running promos and, and Sandy Scott and the Mernicks and a few other people were the local promoters. They, you, I don't know that 30 people full-time worked for Crockett Promotions in the office or promotional area when they grossed $20 million that year. 
you know, it, 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 so that, that was, that was the difference was the infrastructure. The product was far superior and our coverage was the same. Vince beat us out West and in the Northeast, we kicked his ass in the South and in the Southeast Midwest, it was a tie depending on the market and, and the NWA style was more popular down in Texas. So, and, and the ratings for TBS were just as good as USA's ratings, if not better. And the syndicated ratings were pretty goddamn close. Once again, varied from the market, but overall. So it wasn't a matter of a bunch more people seeing one product over another. It was it was just the fact that they had Vince had always had his shit together with his office operation compared to everybody else in wrestling. That was it. That's why that's why McDonald's sells more hamburgers than the fucking guy that makes them from scratch down the block. It doesn't mean they're better hamburgers. It's always been that way. We got beat in the office. We did, we did the job in the office. Hey, one last question, Jim. Vince McMahon seemed to have had a particular dislike for Jim Crockett Jr. In your time around him, did it ever come up? Did he ever say anything about Crockett Promotions or Jim Crockett Jr.? You know, I don't know that anybody's ever asked me that, and I'm trying to think. I cannot remember Vince McMahon ever mentioning Jimmy Crockett's name. But now I was with him next to him, working with him in the office in 96. The the war, you know, the, Crockett was out of the picture in 88. He, he, you know, they TBS paid him as a consultant to not listen to for a while after that. Um, I don't remember Vince ever mentioning Jimmy Crockett's name because he was all, at that time, it was all Turner and Bischoff and, and you know, what was going on at that time. And I mean, let's, let's face it, I, you know, I didn't bring up on a regular basis. Hey, Vince, remember when we could have kicked your ass except you blocked us off pay-per-view, you fucking prick? I didn't (laughs) start that fucking (laughs) conversation. Uh, And I don't – he didn't need to feel the need to bring it up at that point. I can't remember Vince ever mentioning Jimmy Crockett's name. Um, I'm sure that Vince probably disliked him at the time because Jimmy was a – he had a dry personality, very dry, uh, and – I'm sure he was rude to Vince because he probably didn't respect Vince any more than Vince respected him. So I'm sure in whatever dealings they had, you know, especially over the TBS deal, you, you'll choke on that million. Right. Whatever. That's the oh. thing. When when he buys the TBS spot for a million dollars, Vince doesn't say, all right, thank you. Good luck. He says, you're going to choke on that million. Yeah. Who says that to, you know, the person you're making a business deal with? And then I just always look at it. Well, but ben, Vince, I'm sure, was mad because he was, in effect, getting kicked off TBS. Right, because if he hadn't if, sold the spot, uh, Turner was going to kick him off and make the deal with Bill Watts. Yeah, and which, oh, and if that had happened, Lord, then we wouldn't be sitting I wouldn't be sitting here right now talking about quitting the wrestling business if that had happened. He knew how to compete but, with Vince. He knew how to punch Vince back. Yeah, and, and plus, just the... Uh, the what three months that mid South wrestling aired on TBS was the highest rated wrestling program ever on TBS. It beat Georgia championship wrestling. It beat Crockett's program. It especially beat Vince's. It was, it was the highest rated show on cable. Yeah. Because the wrestling fans knew to watch TBS for wrestling and by cracky, when they saw that wrestling, they're like, Holy shit, this is a whole new world. But, you know, and I'm not trying to knock Vince now when I say this, but he doesn't take failure that well. And when I'm sure he thought because he actually thought and he would I know he thought this and I, I would hear him say things that would make me indicate there, even though I wasn't there for this, that he fed that he thought that when they took Georgia Championship Wrestling off the air. And put his product on, just like he thought this in St. Louis, that, well, when they see WWF wrestling instead of this stuff, they're going to go crazy over it. Well, they did go crazy over it. So many people wrote in saying, where is our fucking Gordon Soley wrestling? Get this fucking New York hogwash off our air. That basically Turner was going to boot him off and make the deal with Bill Watts uh, before he sold it to Crockett. And they got an NWA product back on because it was not any good unless you grew up on WWF wrestling in the Northeast. In those days, nobody wanted to watch WWF wrestling over the NWA or or Georgia or Mid-South or whatever, because it, as I mentioned a while ago, the in-ring product was not as good. 
And it was more showbiz at a time where people were re- would rebel against that. They would, well, that's fucking fake. I'm going to go watch the real shit that comes from Charlotte or whatever. That's the way they thought. And Vince probably was so fucking wound up about that, that, that his product was rejected by an entire region of the country that, you know, he wanted to get even. And he did. I always wondered if there was something else there, just because there's such a dichotomy where they grew up in the same state, both from North Carolina, both from... Well, that's another problem. Different sides of the track. <laughs> you know, clearly. Yeah. Both juniors, <laughs> whether it's... Vince- Crockett was a, a rich kid with a father that had, you know, that, that had actually raised him and, and was, you know, well thought of in, in the whole area. And Vince was in North Carolina on the other side of the tracks and didn't get to meet his dad till he was a teenager or whatever. So I'm sure there, but that's what I think that's part of Vince's bias toward the South to begin with. Cause he's like, I wanted to get the fuck out of there. I'm sure he did. But, you know, but it, it, at any rate, that's the thing. I've, it, it was, it, once again, that is another reason why all the promoters always were supposed to stay and why Sam Muchnick had the dream that everybody would stay in their backyard because different areas of the country like different styles of wrestling and the promoters were such bombastic individuals, all of them in their own way, that putting them together in, a, in the same room except it, in Las Vegas once a year for the convention was chaos. So you kept them apart, and they each kept wrestling in their fiefdom as strong as possible. And once that it became, you know, okay, everything's open, just grab what you can, well, then it was fucking chaos, and it led to the downfall of the business. And, you know, it, once again, everybody's, oh, well, it, they were a monopoly. Yes, that's the way it was supposed to be done. That's the way it was supposed to be fucking done. And it's never been able to be done successfully any other way by more than one company because it was supposed to be and each area was supposed to be a monopoly. Keep the outlaws out, keep the fucking amateurs and the goddamn play wrestlers out uh, make sure the business is strong and protected as best you can. And if you fuck up your business, at least it won't overlap state lines into my business. Because nobody in my territory knows that you're around. That was the way that wrestling was done. And it was supposed to be done that way, and it still should be. And we wouldn't have many of these problems.